Okay, good evening, everyone. I am Priya, one of the organizing co-chairs, and I welcome you all to the second day of week eight of IEEE Symposium on Data Analytics and Internet of Things. IEEE Victorian section presents this symposium in collaboration with Computational Intelligence Society, IoT Community, and University of Melbourne Student Branch. And with great pleasure, I would like to share that while this is the last week of the symposium, we have organized a few post-symposium events in the next two weeks. This year has been an unusual year for all of us, and we have tried to make the best use of it uh, for all IEEE and non-IEEE members by organizing an eight-week symposium. And based on the positive feedback that we have received from all of you, we decided to organize a few post-symposium events in the form of workshops and networking sessions. So since you have registered for this week, you will be on our emailing list and will receive emails about those events and uh, hope you will be interested in joining them too. You can also follow our website and social media pages for more updates. So today's topic um, is smart watering for parklands, um, automation and visualization. The talk will be for around 45 minutes with last 15 many minutes dedicated for question and answer session. Please use the question answer tab at the bottom of the window to post your questions. So we have Dr. Biplob Bray as the speaker for this event. Biplob is currently working as a senior lecturer at CQ University, Melbourne with a background mix of uh, research, academic and industry experience. He is highly interested in multidisciplinary research with core interests in secure communication protocols of cyber physical systems, artificial intelligence and internet of things. He has been working in several Australian federal government and industry funded research projects since 2016. He has more than 36 international journal and conference publications and has served as a guest editor um, editorial board member and reviewer in reputed journals. And in 2019, he received CQU Vice Chancellor's Award for his outstanding research. Thank you, Biplo, for joining us today. The floor is all yours. Um, thank you, Priya. So um, thank you for a nice introduction. Before I get started, um, I have a couple of acknowledgements to go through. Um, the first one, um, welcome to the country. I respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we work and learn and pay respect to First Nations peoples and their elders past, present and future. And the second one is uh, our funding body um, detailed on this slide uh, and the entire team who are working on this project. Now, um, the entire talk will be more on system implementation and how research can be embedded actually real industry implementation. Um, so there are five different um, main sections I will walk you through. I will start with data collection and then accumulation, data abstraction and visualization, the decision making, and finally automate the physical system. So let's get started. So the system I'm talking today is a, a automated irrigation control decision support system. Now, ideally we water either in the farm or um, on parkland or in our uh, home garden. But those decision of watering come from either from our experience or timer-based control. The problem with um, either of those semi-automated approach and putting experience uh, with it is we often may not make the right decision or may make the right, make the right decision, but we have to be engaged with the system. And also the event of raining and weather change needs to be monitored, uh, then process, and then trigger the system manually. The idea of this project is to automate the entire system. Um, hence, we have quite a few components um, to automate and making those decisions. The, of course, the main point is uh, live data collection, soil moisture, and uh, live soil moisture data then fed to the system, including my, a local weather station data. We also have soil properties, plant water use, 
and lysimeter data. Now, I will mainly focus in IoT system and IoT-based weather station, and finally, how we use those data using AI to automate. So let's get, let's get started. First thing, um, or the starting process of any IoT systems data collection is to embed sensor or install sensor. Now, the type of sensor and where it will be installed can contribute heavily to decide what sensor to uh, choose from. Now, in our case, our sensor goes under soil, including its communication system, and it goes 7, 15, 30, and 90 centimeters. And one of the reason of our sensor going that deep because we wanna ensure that the extra water doesn't go to um, our stream, or in this case, Great Barrier Reef. This project was done in Keynes. Hence, a reef is just beside the um, test site. So we can make sure there are no extra water sitting underneath and then release to the stream and uh, creating coral bleaching. Now, of course, uh, you need to also consider external environmental factor, which may damage sensor or hinder installation. Now, um, decision of one sensor in one spot or area of sensor also needs to be decided. In our case, we had um, area of sensors, four in one particular location in four different depth. These sensors are connected to a node, which is a communication module, the consideration of cost and longevity is very important because how long system or the battery and how much you pay for sensor needs to be um, essentially a, a contributing factor to investment of return. You can buy a sensor of $3,000 or you can buy same sensor in $300. So the difference needs to be determined by these two factors. Do you have a fixed power source? Otherwise, it has to be battery powered what technique this sensor used to transmit uh, or um, sense the data. In our case, our moisture sensor used a standing wave technique, needs to know to interpret the data. And finally, and most importantly, do you have a local storage before you send the data to cloud? So when you know which sensor to install, the next decision comes where to install and how many because in our case, it's a parkland and parkland, we cannot put thousands of sensors to cover every inch. So decision was conductivity survey. So what it, we did, we used frequency to survey the entire parkland and that frequency gave us different zone based on the water content of the field. And this uh, contour map you are seeing on the um, slide has distinctive three different color, yellow, green, and red. Yellow means dry, meaning less water than uh, ideally it should. Green means about right, and red means too much water. So we then decided that our sensor needs to monitor each zone. Um, this is a common problem in any a sensor based IoT systems, installing sen sensor needs to be determined with quite a few variables. Now, when you decided that, uh, next part is we need to calibrate the sensor. Now, calibration um, required for the salinity of the ground and also to understand how that varies in, in different form of salinity because when the sensors will be installed on field, it needs to essentially differentiate that solidity level which contribute to the value of moisture reading coming from the sensor. Um, also other external factors, like if there is a, this is a park and they may have sometime uh, live music or parties, those frequency interfere with the signal of sensor. This needs to be heavily considered. Later stage, I will talk about noise cancellation. This um, noise cancellation is a part of eliminating this external interference, but there are others 
external factor which also needs to be considered. All right, um, th this is essentially sensor installation. On right side, you are seeing uh, the sensor installed underground um, and also lysimeter. Lysimeter essentially what it does, it stores the water and then we can measure the water to know how much water is sitting underground after using, because uh, we all know the grass and, and uh, shallow plant um, where root doesn't go in depth, the water is not necessarily too deep in the soil. We also installed a micro weather station now um, to localize the weather data, because that bomb data essentially give us a good amount, uh, good information, but that is not super accurate to the location where we are um, controlling a sprinkler. Hence, local weather station is very uh, crucial. Also, it can tell uh, or it can um, counter the thunderstorm um, danger. Uh, and that, that's also a crucial um, or a very important feature of this micro weather station. So what it does, it gives wind direction, um, gas, uh, gas uh, windy speed, and so on. Using those data, we can essentially calculate a uh, data point called evapotranspiration, which is a key element um, to understand the weather requirement, uh, the water requirement for plants and farmlands. So, when we have those micro station and sensors installed, the next bit is how do we collect the, those data remotely? And as I mentioned, um, those gadgets installed there must transmit live data remotely, which can be accessible from anywhere. And our decision will come from that anywhere. So there are quite a few ways IoT world um, communicate the, with these sensors. The first one is communication via gateway. The second one is communication without gateway, where uh, information sends from one center to an another sensor, then that sensor to a root sensor or main sensor, which communicates then with the cloud. Uh, the last one is direct communication. Now, in our case, particularly, we used gateway. Now, in case of direct communication from sensor to the cloud, uh, you can use LTE. Um, communication system using 4G, 5G. Um, in our case, in the gateway, we used LoRa one or low power wide area network communication system. There are a few factors need to be considered to decide on this. First one is power. How do you power that gateway device or the main sensor? Because if the main sensor dies, you pretty much lose the system how much distance to cover. So soon I will show the gateway we have used and it covers five to 10 kilometers. But if you use sensor, then it's another story. External condition, like the place where you are putting the gateway or may root sensor, uh, does it require line of sight? So uh, the lower one gateway on right side was installed in this uh, particular project and this gateway works as a controller which can essentially communicate with thousand sensors within five to ten kilometer radius depends on line of sight um, uh, communication this uh, controller can also convert it to an edge computing gate um, system and um, as we all know edge computing is a very crucial component um, for a sustainable and scalable system. The gateway gets powered either with PoE, and in our case it's solar, solar powered, or, um, and also the gateway I'm showing here has a Wi-Fi communication um, to get connected to the backhaul if we don't wanna use 4G or LTE, but it is capable of communicating via LTE too. So, the controller-based communication is sustainable and more 
um, reliable in many cases, especially if it's a remote communication system development. Now, the gateway has dashboard. Um, this just a screenshot of the dashboard. There are a lot of information here, which not particularly related to this project, but anyone can manage the gateway or the controller using the dashboard operating system. Um, so, so far, we, I have talked about the micro weather station, gateway, sensors, and this wireless communication system we have established so far in this talk has array of sensor talking to the gateway using wireless communication of LoRaWAN and micro weather station also talking to the gateway using LoRaWAN. The next, um, Next bit is how the gateway upload the data or talk to the cloud system. Now, there are many ways this can be done. The system we have used is a middleware and open source or free system. Um, so it, the choice here is do you use open source um, system or you use a paid service? Uh, of course, I am an advocate for um, open source technologies. So in this case, we use the Things Network. But there are other services like Grid Locate, Sigfox Cloud, NB-IoT Shield. Um, many of these can be used. Or oh, MQTT Server. Or there are many free MQTT Server too, which can be used. Now, the Things Network is a middleware. What it does, it let the gateway and sensor uh, transmit information to anywhere else. So it's a middleware, collect the information, pass it on, um, especially if you're using the free service. So in our case, we connected through Things Network, put all the communication through Things Network and then pass it on to cloud. Now, how the Things Network connect to the cloud? I'm coming to soon, but in Things Network, there are a few um, elements to consider. Make sure you know TTN doesn't store data unless you get to their paid service. It's just a middleware. It gets the data, pass it on. Um, the TTN settings has two components, application and gateway, which is controlled by ownership. Um, the frequency, you need to set the Australian frequency. If you set it in Australia, we have a, um, AU915. Um, and then, of course, the format of data you are getting, which needs to be decoded as it gets to cloud. Now, um, this is how data looks like in the TTN system. As you can see, there are two parts of this data. One is metadata, one is event data and also the payload. Now payload essentially required to be decoded because it's a signal and hexa um, before it goes to or stores in the cloud. But metadata is equally important. Um, from a point of view of knowing the health of the system and also to ensure that you maintain the system. There are a lot more research required to be done in this area to use this metadata and understanding the health of entire IoT network. Now, from that particular middleware, it's time to store information in cloud. Before we store the cloud, we have used a open source coding system called Node-RED. Node-RED, uh, it, it was a project from IBM, um, and now it's widely available. What Node-RED does, Node-RED essentially connect with TTN or Things Network, then decode the data. And from there, you can pass it to any system you want. Where to host the Node-RED? Node-RED can be hosted within a cloud uh, server, okay? Or you can host the node to a local computer and the pass the data to a cloud server. Um, there are paid services for node like FRED, but node is uh, 
open source and it's pretty good um, unless you are, I mean, you, if you're looking for non-technical solution of Node.js, Fred could be a good um, solution too. Now from Node.js, the, all the data gets to now cloud server. Okay, um, and then cloud server, what do you do with this data? Remember, uh, these sensors are sending data every 15 minutes. And there are enormous amount of data because um, every sensor signal uh, sends value 15 minutes and we had about 32 sensors and the micro the station. So it's a lot of data. Cloud server, of course, need to be uh, there to store. Now you can have a virtual server in in any cloud, or you can have container-based solution where you store data. Now, this, regardless of whatever system we use, we have to have a database to store it. Now, so far we talked about from um, gateway to middleware and then cloud system, and we will see how we store in the cloud and how we embed our artificial intelligence, um, oh, before that, how we process the data and use the artificial intelligence to make the decision. So this is um, a snapshot of one of the Node-RED instance we have. And Node-RED can get the metadata from um, Things Network or um, from the controller to Things Network to um, your database, and also the payload data, actual data. And the data needs to be um, decoded or processed, uh, not the data, rather signal. Signal needs to be processed, which, which came as a hexa. And most of the provider or manufacturer do have a decode code, which then of course needs to be modified um, based on the uh, system's need. And um, this is how metadata and information looks like after decoding. Um, so metadata, as you see at the top, and you have payload, uh, there are four sensors, probe one, probe two, probe three, probe four, and their value, and some more metadata. Now, these are raw data, raw moisture sensor data. And this needs to go through quite a few uh, steps to get it intelligible because we want to know moisture content and num number this big doesn't say much. And by the way, we also collect battery voltage so we know how it's operating. So we didn't use all the metadata, but some of them. And this is um, a snapshot of local weather station data or micro weather station. As you can see, there are different uh, parameters. Some of those parameters essentially um, needs to be interpreted in relation to other parameters to go um, and find out evapotranspiration value. Now, a storing. Um, do you go with the open source or paid version? If you go with open source, there are a solution like InfluxDB, time series database, which we used. Um, if you go with my, my uh, SQL, you still have some of the open source platform, which gives you cloud storage. But if you go with virtual server, it's always good to go with a bundle, which comes with InfluxDB chronograph dashboard together. And I will show you a little bit of dashboard. Um, and I'll mention some of the uh, open source technology can be used for dashboard um, for visualization. Um, it's always good to have your own data storage um, in a virtual server using open source rather than going paid because this is massive amount of data. A paid version will be very costly, okay? Um, in, in, in essential essence of storing time series data, InfluxDB has a very um, nice architecture which can essentially get time-bounded data, store it automatically and put the timestamp by default, okay? Um, the, you can go with cloud and two. Um, so this is how um, our data looks for these two particular sets of um, components. Our 
moisture sensors and micro station. This is in the database, um, database console of Influx TV. Now, the important part is um, how do we now understand this data? Because this data has no value. Okay. And also, when you are collecting this data from micro station, how do you know your micro station is working fine? For sensor calibration, as, I, as we mentioned, calibration data can be used to verify sensors activity. But for micro station, we need to compare it with BOM data. Okay, and then we find some synergy saying that the data we are getting either say for example rainfall if we if we get the rainfall data of our micro station and bombs rainfall data then we can find um, the calibration point or the functionality or right state of functionality of our micro station these are very crucial stage to use this data because we, we can use a lot of machine learning AI technique, but if we don't understand the data, don't process the data right, it will at the end of the day, will have wrong outcome. Um, then last one is noise cancellation. Now, even we verify, as I said, there are external interference and there are also other factors like for micro um, there, there can be cover, uh, which didn't uh, let the micro station function properly. So at the end of the day, there should be a good noise cancellation technique after analyzing the data. Now, to interpret those big numbers of moisture um, sensors, um, there is volumetric moisture content. We need to convert those numbers. And most of the cases, based on the technique used by manufacturer, there are formula to convert those number to a understandable outcome or understandable output which can have a unit. So in this case, the formula is showing we are converting those big numbers to volumetric moisture content. And on right side, you are seeing a dashboard where we are interpreting this data and putting in dashboard. So we can just say, okay, today volumetric moisture content is 10, or tomorrow is 11 and so on. Now, visualization. Um, now there, there are different options here and many of them are open source and there are paid. Now, in our case, we used chronograph, but Node can Node has also a dashboard. Um, and Grafana is one other very good tool for visualization. Grafana has a cloud version to which is paid though. And as uh, you realize, um, when you go to paid version, you have to um, pay as you go. The chronograph we used open source, which build with capacitor, which is an alert system and influx DB database. So it's a good package. Grafana comes with its own alert system. Okay, um, and also there are home automation dashboard. So these are all open source dashboard. Um, you can adapt one or other. When you develop dashboard, there are three things to consider. You can develop a dashboard uh, for backend uh, researcher and scientist and uh, people who are knowledgeable to the system. And there should be a different version for uh, customer or consumer. The reason behind that is most of the cases, um, a scientist develop a backend which requires a lot of knowledge um, and not always understood by consumer or customer. So there should be two, two sets and customer dashboard should be more textual uh, representation with explanation. All right, some of the snapshot, this is a Grafana visualization, uh, visualizing and alerting. Grafana is a lot more graphic and it has more capability. Um, compared to Nodred, which is very simple and sometimes is difficult to present um, a depth uh, of a graphical representation. And chronograph sits just in middle, okay? And so this is a chronograph dashboard 
um, where we presented our micro weather stations data. As you can see, um, it does have enough to present all the data in visual form, but not in uh, high level extent, which would be nice to have, especially for consumer. All right, um, the, this is the capacitor alert system. Now this is fantastic. This can essentially identify if a sensor is not sending signal. Uh, if entire system met a threshold, it can email, it can send SMS to um, a group of people to alert them. And which is very required to have any system as this scale. Now, um, this is a snapshot of the data set which we use. Now, ET represent evapotranspiration. S10, S120, S30, S90 is the depth of the sensors. Then we have rain. And final outcome is our decision we made is about time and how much water to use for the day. Now, yes, now we have a data set which we understand. And we wanna automate the decision of this time and frequency. And remember this data set is live. So here, essentially you need to have a incremental learning decision system. And um, so there are two factors we have decided mainly using this system's brain, uh, time and frequency and duration. Intelligent, intelligent decision-making considered soil moisture, plant needs, and evapotranspiration, as I show uh, shown you there, and also local weather data. Now, what particular algorithm to use? Now, we went through a long list. I didn't put all of those, but we used deep learning, which has an incremental learning curve, meaning it learns as it as, as data fed to it. And we fit that algorithm in our cloud-based system so it can push this decision automated way to the sprinkler and run it or stop it, which I will show you shortly. So far, we went the system this far. We have alert system, we have metadata for system health, um, and we do have a machine learning which essentially decide watering. But now the decision feedback system. We need to just make sure the decision made in the cloud fed back to the sprinkler system. So the entire cycle completes um, a very little or no, no human intervention required for a long time, unless there is a breakdown of uh, equipment. So let's look into that. Um, so automation driven by data. What format of data we need to fed back? Now, we are talking about a sprinkler and a sprinkler has a controller. The controller in our case came from a, a sprinkler system who has very limited uh, external input. So we had to work um, with a lot of different elements to ensure we send the right signal and it control it. But how? we send that signal. It has to be wireless signal um, and it has to be to the controller. So we designed an actuator. Um, and that actuator essentially takes input from our cloud system wirelessly um, to the controller. Actuator works with, in our case, MQTT broker, um, but you can use IoT VT type uh, system too to transmit information to the actuator's common transporter. Now, the actuator we use, it can be either microprocessor or microcontroller based actuator. Depends how much processing capability you need to the actuator. And if your actuator is a edge computing device, needs to be a edge computing device, which runs AI in it, then it has to be, of course, uh, powerful. It has to have a processor. But in our case, we didn't put too much pressure to the actuator because our input um, inputs are not heavy and doesn't need to be processed in the actuator. So in our case, the um, 
microcontroller was fine. Okay. So going to the next bit, I will show you the microcontroller we have designed. But one more thing before that, and the communication system of the microcontroller needs to be designed such a way that it, it can run by itself. Um, and in our case, we use 4G communication system, but as well can be designed using LP1 or LoRa1 if uh, your input type is not too heavy. Because remember, LoRa1 is not built for um, high payload and very uh, intense transmission system. So this is our actuator. Um, as you can see, we do have, we used a Raspberry Pi um, based system, uh, Arduino, we tested Arduino, Arduino works fine too. Um, and then on right side, you have the package system where, uh, and this little cover is where our communication system um, put in and hence this can receive data based on our uh, software in the actuator from our cloud system after the decision making. So this is the whole system we have built now. And uh, essentially that's the life cycle of a IoT system starting from data collection to the final end. Uh, briefly, but that's the whole life cycle. The final note, um, the, based on, well, I went through a system design uh, approach rather than uh, going through difficult equation and research point of view, but I will show you some of the learning we have achieved out, out of the system and the research direction um, we think is needs to be done uh, for further announcement of the entire field. Um, so, um, research direction. Remember, we I mentioned about uh, conductivity uh, scanning, and that conductivity scanning uh, to prepare our contour map, which gave us zone to install the sensor, um, and that was essentially done by a huge um, frequency-based system. Someone needs to push or drive, um, it's very difficult for a large farmland or um, a vineyard. Um, in that case, some research can, um, should be done to expand such a way that a um, UAV based scanning. So it's a lot um, efficient, lots um, easier to be done. Second uh, research direction, um, is very crucial, extrapolation. Now, the, this is not only for this particular project, but uh, as a whole sensor system needs this. See, ideally what we did, we installed um, three sensors in three zone, but then we are getting data for only one square meter where the sensor is. But we don't know a lot more, which goes in between one sensor to another sensor. We know in general how one zone looks like, but it will be interesting to know um, if we can use machine learning um, to essentially use three points data to plot the data for entire land or entire test site. And this is true for many sensor-based system. Ideally sensors are installed in a particular point and um, we get the data from that point. For some system, it's not a problem, but others like in a farm, it's a serious issue. Then finally, uh, we used the gateway, which can cover a good uh, range. But if we can have large number of gateway connected meshed connection, then probably we can deploy large scale system in, in a remote island or remote community where uh, 4G, or many of those backhole connection is poor or not available. And having um, that, having said that, um, any question? Uh, 
Sorry. Um, thank you, Biplop. Thank you for the um, for the great talk. And now we open the floor to questions. So we have a few questions from Alan. Um, he asks, what is Loro One? Um, Loro One is a low power wider network communication system, which is uh, open source. And it uses a uh, free frequency band, meaning uh, unlicensed frequency band. Okay, thank you. Um, his next question is, in slide showing watering in park, how were DC inputs supplied to IoT system? Uh, it, sorry, um, repeat that, Priya. Um, in slide, the, the, I, there's a slide where you're showing the wat watering in the park. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that particular slide, he has a question that how were the DC inputs supplied to the IoT system? The moisture sensors sense this data. Um, so as soon as the water gets uh, or the sprinkler gets opened, um, the moisture sensor sense the moisture value. And also there is a lag, as you realize sensor data to come to us and the water gets to the ground. That's why we have a seven centimeter depth and a forecasting mechanism to forecast. So ideally what you do, we forecast based on our data input for five hours ahead. So the sh um, short answer is our moisture sensor does that. Long answer is we use moisture sensor input, which is live feed to our system, also forecasting mechanism to um, bridge the gap if in case there is one. Um, thank you. Uh, there's a follow-up question from Les on that. Uh, for the soil moisture sensors, what technology is being used? Um, I don't know if that's already answered in, in um, the I did um, on the slide. So there, there are quite a few technology for um, sensors, but in this particular sensor we have bought, um, use, give me a second. I'll just go to that slide. Um, a standing web technology. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, the next question is, how do you interface to LoRaWAN? The, oh, so the, the question is a little bit generic. How do you interface LoRaWAN to what? Um, Les, would you like to talk? So you can um, unmute yourself and maybe you can give an explanation. Yes, uh, Bitlob, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, okay, thanks. Just back to the soil uh, moisture sensor first. You mentioned it's a standing wave. So mm -hmm. could you elaborate, elaborate on that? Is it using a, a microwave system in some way? Yeah, it does. So what it does, it has three pin, as you see. So it passes um, a frequency and then from that, it just measured the wavelength because it does change based on conductivity and salinity. Okay, understood. And um, from there it calculates. Yeah, understood. The question about interfacing was just um, what, uh, how do you actually interface from the sensor uh, to the uh, LoRaWAN system, Laura system? Is it an analog voltage, a current? What's the interfacing technique? Um, so first of all, it's a LoRaWAN communication and the interfacing technique is not Analog is a digital signal we have received through LoRaWAN. I uh, know, but between your soil mo moisture sensor and the LoRaWAN transmitter. Ah, uh, it's a direct connection. That's analog connection. Okay. Just a varying voltage? Yep. Okay. And lastly, just could you um, give an indication of the cost of each sensor? Um, well, these sensors are very costly um, because of with high salinity, we had to go with the costly solution. Um, these are uh, $600 a piece, meaning each probe cost us 600, but there are solution of moisture sensor which can be bought in $100 or 50 uh, range, 50 to 100 range. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Les. 
Um, so we have follow-up question from Alan uh, based on his question on DC inputs to the IoT system. He's asking, how do you supply power to the sensors? Now, we do have two uh, different power source as a backup. One is direct connection uh, because we can. It's a council property and they're happy to give us direct power connection. But we have a backup battery system. So we can run this uh, particular node and sensor together for uh, four months without charging the battery. Um, but I also uh, tried uh, some solar-based powering system or charging system, but for our project, that wasn't an option because these are deployed in a place where a lot of people walk through and have party. Hence, um, we cannot have anything external. But in a situation where it's possible, solar can be a good charging solution without direct power source. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, what is Lysi meter? Um, Lysi meter is a equipment, um, mostly in farming, um, they use it uh, and uh, soil science, uh, scientists use it. It's equipment which can uh, store the water um, in a, and then you can take the water out without digging every uh, week and know how much water was sitting idle in a depth. So in our case, we put this on a 90 centimeter under to understand how much water sits there, which may then release to the Great Barrier Reef um, because this water always come with different chemicals, which is one of the reason of bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef. Thank you, Biplog. Um, the next question is, how does actuator work? Actuator. Um, so actuator, I'll go to the slide so it's more relevant. Um, so when it's, uh, how does it works? It does have so many components. So first I will start um, step by step. So it does have a microcontroller which essentially connected to a relay. Microcontroller has our software, which we designed to get input from 4G in this case. And you can design also with LoRaWAN. We tried both, but we used 4G at the end. Um, so your microcontroller, either Arduino or Raspberry, Pi or you have other solutions, uh, we tried four and they all work great, but we chose finally with Raspberry Pi. Works connected with relay and 4G. So our signal from our cloud passed to the Raspberry Pi using 4G. Um, so we have a, a small client module of the software, which then interpret the signal and pass it to the sprinkler controller. And controller does the rest because the uh, each sprinkler system has a solenoid valve, but which are controlled by controller. But this controller essentially um, at the current point works based on scheduling um, and semi-automated, doesn't have any brain to decide um, based on previous data or um, evapotranspiration in local place and future upcoming weather forecasting. Hence, our system give the decision to the controller from our actuator, and then, of course, it acts based on it. Thank you, Biplob. Those were all the questions from Alan, and he says, thank you for, in for an inter interesting real-world system. Um, the next question mm -hmm. is, what applications could this have in rural areas of India for farming where connectivity is also an issue? What problems could it solve? Um, there, there, and, and that, thank you for that question. And um, that's exactly where I was uh, showing the research problem. The main point of developing the system is to trial, uh, get rid of dependency in of GPRS and 4G. And as you see, uh, as I show the system, I still show shown that I have used 
LTE connection or 4G in a couple of places. One in controller, one is actuator. Now actuator, we have trialed without 4G and it works fine. Now think the entire system without any 4G works within 10 kilometer radius. So in rural area, if your uh, backhaul connection or LT connection is not good, you can have a local system which can then uh, expand five to 10 kilometer before it gets to internet. And the system will work fine regardless of internet system because the cloud system I was talking about that essentially can be the controller edge computing. If that answer questions, otherwise, please let me know. Um, yes, I think so, because we don't have a follow-up question to that. And that was a good explanation. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what type of deep learning algorithm did you use and which other machine learning methods did you try? Well, uh, that's a long list, but uh, at the end of the day, we ended up with a modified version of LSTM, uh, long short-term memory, um, if you know. Um, and the LSTM, we have modified with the incremental learning. So what it does, it train itself and then use the train model to learn further to sharpen its, uh, itself. We have tried a statistical method, traditional machine learning like neural network and so on, um, there are few works done um, in this field using those. Um, and hence we thought it uh, would be nice to, and, and many of them or none of them rather used incremental learning, um, which considered stream live data feed to learn further. So yes, sh short answer is LSTM, um, modified LSTM. And um, in terms of what we tried, we tried Exibust, we tried um, neural network and many other existing um, of the shelf algorithms. Thank you, Biblob. I think Alan wants to talk. Hi. Sure. Uh, uh, yes, Jeff. Uh, yeah, hi, Biplob. Thanks for an interesting real world talk. Uh, in, you have to turn on a, a water system in the end. So is the final operator a um, a water valve is it on off or does it vary the volume of flow or in other words is it analog or digital or what is the mode of operation of the actual sprinkler itself um in our end it's a binary input okay so what our actuator does a uh, controller has different bulbs in it, or uh, they call it segments. So we put binary input to it to either on or off based on our data um, and decision. So when it gets turned on, we know based on our decision, does it require to turn on and how much time? So if not, we just turn it off. So our input is binary input to the controller. Okay, so it's, uh, there's no variation, it's simply on or off and therefore full flow or zero flow. Is Correct. that fair uh, comment? Yep, yeah, it is fair comment. And that's one of the research direction. See, we saw the flow of the water and, and also the wind direction, which controls the flow. Um, but to change that, essentially you need a change to the sprinkler system itself, where you can have duplex communication system. Um, unfortunately, in our knowledge, uh, very few or none provide you duplex communication where you get the um, information from the bulb level or solenoid level at, at all. Hence, it requires a software integration to the um, a sprinkler manufacturer, if that needs to be done. But in our case, we couldn't go that far. Okay, uh, thank you for, for that information. Mm. Thank you, Alan, thank you, Biblob. Uh, so we have one more question. Uh, why do you use smart sprinkler instead of normal irrigation? Um, 
there are a few reasons. First one is any wastage of water in a uh, summer situation is uh, not good for entire nation, our entire world, uh, because we have limited amount of um, water uh, source which can be used for that purpose. Second or more important reason is these are parks or farmland. You need to have a controlled water. Say, for example, you're growing a crop, okay? Um, turning it on, a, on and off based on your experience requires a lot of time and you need to just essentially depend on your experience if you have a lot of experience. Now, in the park, that's not even possible because um, in the park, if you water too much, a lot of people will come there um, and they will complain to the council. Um, and on be, uh, the grass won't be green, hence there will be complaint. The third one is the extra water we are putting in a land um, because we are not using a smart sprinkler, sits underneath the water and goes to our stream. And hence those water can have chemical, which is not only bad for our um, water resources like fish and uh, other living um, uh, beings, but also um, that is at the end of the day can be harmful for ourselves and the reef where this project was done. Thank you, Biblo. Do we have any more questions? No, I think that is it. Um, so thank you everyone for attending the talk and a big thanks to Biplo for taking our time to share his knowledge on smart watering for parklands. Um, it was very informative and I'm sure everyone found it uh, very insightful too. For tomorrow, we have the panel discussion on the topic, today's challenges in IoT security and AI. Um, and uh, for the post symposium events, we will be sending out an email over the weekend with the details of the next week's sessions. So I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow in the panel discussion. It's going to be very interesting and also in the post symposium events. Take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheerio, bye, Bob. Uh, yep, uh, very interesting talk. Thank you.